from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. The 2005 Holiday Lectures on Science. This year's lectures, Evolution, Constant Change, and Common Threads, will be given by Dr. Sean B. Carroll, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Dr. David M. Kingsley, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at Stanford University School of Medicine. The second lecture is titled, Selection in Action. And now to introduce our program, the Vice President for Grants and Special Programs of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Peter Bruns. Welcome back to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, for our 13th Holiday Lectures in Science. Now, over the years, we've created, we have a whole series of very interesting lectures, but we've created a lot of other uh, resources that go along with those. And we've put all of that material, the lectures, animations, virtual labs, and so on, on a special website called biointeractive.org. And I, I encourage you to, to go over to that website at some point and see what else is there, biointeractive.org. Our next speaker in this series is Dr. David Kingsley, an HHMI investigator from Stanford University. Uh, David is well known uh, in the scientific community for developing molecular tools to study natural populations of stickleback fish. But before he uh, talks about that sort of form of natural selection, David is going to first talk about selection as artificial selection uh, for a number of organisms, including, for example, the dog. Uh, so here is a uh, short video to introduce David. I was interested in lots of things when I was in early school. I had loved dinosaurs as a kid. Most kids are fascinated by big bodies and interesting structures when they're small. From that time on, I was fascinated by shape and, uh, shape and morphology and, and vertebrates. So right now my whole lab works on skeletal development and we've used a variety of organisms to look at that. About seven or eight years ago we got very interested in trying to use the same genetic techniques that have been so successful in studying lots of other hard problems to study a really hard problem which is the genetic basis of vertebrate evolution. We ended up uh, having found uh, this small fish called the three-spine stickleback, which has undergone one of the most spectacular uh, evolutionary radiations on Earth. Lots of the interesting uh, populations can be found here in California. Uh, and that makes it possible to go fishing nearby, collect organisms that have undergone incredible morphological change in the last 10,000 years, bring them into laboratory, and actually look at the genetic basis of what has made them uh, what has made them different. A lot of people think evolution is just sort of this curiosity uh, uh, driven science and it's much more than that. A lot of uh, current medicine is based on what we know about evolution. So um, every time you're treated with antibiotics uh, because you have a bacterial infection, the uh, physician and you are facing an evolutionary arms race between the bacteria that's in your system, a drug that's killing the bacteria, and the bacteria's uh, attempt to evolve uh, to avoid the drug that's killing, uh, killing most of the bacteria. That's evolution. I hope that by the end of the holiday lectures, uh, people will have a new appreciation for both the diversity of living things, but at the same time, the common origins of, uh, of living things. Evolution is all around us. Evolution is what has generated the foods that we eat, the pets that we keep, the strategies for treating um, infectious disease uh, in, in the hospital. It isn't just a historical process. It's something uh, that continues all around us today and in the most relevant ways possible. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, Sean gave you a great introduction to both Charles Darwin and the idea of natural selection. 
Darwin originally coined the term uh, natural selection by analogy uh, to a process of artificial selection. It's well known uh, uh, by human breeders. Human breeders uh, take natural variants that occur all the time, choose uh, traits that they're particularly interested in, breed selectively from the plants or animals that show those traits, and by doing so develop uh, new breeds that can look very different uh, from, from the original animals. Darwin and Wallace realized that a very similar process would happen uh, in nature. So wild plants and animals vary in all sorts of random ways. But animals, uh, many more are produced than can possibly reproduce or survive. So inevitably, uh, more offspring will be generated from those random variants that are the best adapted to particular environments. As Sean emphasized, environmental conditions on the Earth change all the time. And so animals uh, are constantly being selected for those that do the best in changing environmental conditions. And Darwin and Wallace proposed that would produce major changes uh, in nature, just as uh, humans had done in artificial selection. People, I think, are always surprised at just how much plants and animals can be changed by this simple process of selecting uh, for random variants that occur. So I think it's worth uh, going through a couple of examples because it is true that uh, the products of selection are all around us. Selection has generated what we eat, uh, the kinds of pets that we keep. And I'll give one example today uh, from the plant world and one example uh, from the animal world. So let's start uh, with corn. So corn's a great example. It's one of the major agricultural crops uh, in the US, a major food source for both uh, people and animals around the world. So there's words for uh, the corn and maize in uh, every language around the world. Corn is planted on every continent of the world except for Antarctica. And despite that widespread distribution, it all arose from domestication events uh, that occurred originally in North America. And that's summarized uh, in the next video. So although now widely planted around the world, corn was originally developed as a local agricultural crop by Native Americans in Mexico. These people are harvesting corn. Notice the tall stalks, the large ears that grow. You can pull these off and uh, each ear has hundreds of kernels. Corn was originally developed by these people's ancestors who recognized the potential of a wild plant to give rise to a useful agricultural crop. Interestingly, that wild plant, Tiacente, looks very different from modern corn. So the seeds look completely different. The overall architecture of the plant also looks quite different. Wild Tiacente has a bushy-like appearance. Corn grows in these tall stalks. So very dramatic alterations uh, in the architecture of the plant, really all of its features, bushy or tall, uh, and its seeds as well. Let's look in greater detail at the seed structure in this wild ancestor, uh, Tiacente. So this uh, wild plant is native to uh, valleys in Mexico and Central America. Its seeds uh, are shown here. It actually just has a few seeds. So typically a fruiting body of Tiacente might have five or 12 uh, kernels that are completely encased in a stony fruit case uh, that's shown there as the brown structures on the left. In Tiacente, those uh, stony fruit cases actually break off into individual seeds that can be swallowed by animals and uh, pass through the digestive tract to spread the seeds. Ancient breeders selected for major changes in uh, seed and cob morphology in the course of turning uh, that original uh, stony fruit cases into what's seen today in maize. So essentially what the uh, ancient breeders had to do was turn the original stony fruit cases inside out to reveal uh, the, the corn kernels uh, inside, which are displayed on the surface of a corn, uh, corn cob. The stony fruit cases also softened and turned into the interior of the corn cob instead of the hard, uh, the hard, hard outer case. Similarly, major changes in overall branching architecture. So Tiacente is a wide, bushy plant. Corn is a tall plant. The uh, ears of the corn are supported on the central stalk. And the tall plant makes it possible to pack in.